Let's take our Bibles tonight. I want you to open to the book of Job. Job chapter number one. I've been reading through um, this book of Job over the last week or so. And uh, Job's a very interesting book. It's unique. It's the first of the poetry books. The Bible has books of history and different categories we put them in, but it's in the first of the poetry books. It includes the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, even Lamentations. <clears throat> but the reference to the poetry books doesn't mean that it's a rhyming, you know, uh, like the sea spot run type of thing. It, it is a... Hebrew poetry speaks of, um, it's a parallel of ideas that come together. And the book of Job really is a, has a lot of conversations. And all those conversations are in a, in a poetry form. And so it's not rhythmic, it's not poetry and what you learned in school, but it's different. The human author of the book of Job is really unknown. We don't know who wrote it. We know God wrote it, but who he used to write it, we really don't know. Some have suggested Moses. Some have suggested <clears throat> um, Ezra, Solomon, Job himself, obviously comes into consideration. Elihu, who is one of Job's miserable comforters, he's also considered. Another interesting thing about the book of Job is that we do not know the time period in which Job lived. And we do not know where he lived. And you say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Connor, and we're going to read that verse in just a moment. There was a man in the land of Uz. <clears throat> and that's great, but we don't have any idea where Uz is. That's sort of a play on words, poetic. Uz is, get it? Okay. Uh, we have no location. It's never been located, been no historical thing. Many feel because of a uh, relationship to a man named Huz that might have started this kingdom named Uz, might have been in the Syrian deserts. So it's yet to be located. And so it's interesting that the time and the place, which a lot of times we like to dig out when we begin a book study type of thing, and we're not going to launch into a whole book study tonight, but they're not given to us. Some suggest that maybe Job wrote during the days of the patriarchs of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And the reason being because he makes no reference to anything about the law of God. There's no Ten Commandments. He doesn't refer to any of those things. And certainly um, there's nothing there, uh, nothing about the events that happened in the Exodus or anything of that nature. So it seems like it was probably before all of those events, before they went down into Egypt. Now, Job is considered to be the oldest book in the Bible. And it contains the story of a man by the name of Job. Very good. This is not a trick question, I thought. Verse number one, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. So Job was obviously richly blessed of God, given the fruits of an abundant lifestyle. He had a large family, something that was very important in those days, seven sons, three daughters, and his material wealth really was something for his day. When your livestock numbers in the thousands upon thousands of, of animals, it really means that you are a very rich man indeed. But most importantly, he was a man who had a genuine relationship with God. And that fact is repeated for us several times throughout this book, which brings me to our study tonight. Now, I want to go a little bit further down to verse number six. We're going to talk a little bit more, then we'll pray and we'll get into the main thrust of the message. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, Satan, anybody know what Satan means? It means adversary. Now, adversary is someone who's against you, right? Right? He's not for you, he's against you. 
And so his very name means he's an adversary. And Satan truly is an adversary of anyone and everyone. That's just who he is. So Satan came in. Now these sons of God were angels that were coming before God and sort of uh, reporting to the Lord on their obedient service and they're busy doing the bidding of God. And Satan, who has been cast out of heaven already, comes now and, and sort of uh, sneaks in among them. Hmm. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So if you can imagine this scene in heaven that these angels, angelic beings, are coming before God, giving accounts and whatever it is that they're doing up there during those days, but Satan comes in amongst them and he obviously at one time was there. He was the anointed cherub. He was Lucifer. He was the, really uh, an extremely powerful angel and he's been cast out, but he makes his way in amongst them and God says, well, why are you here, Satan? Why, what is it you've been doing? And he says, well, you know, God, I've been down on earth looking over <clears throat> my dominion and I've been... Uh, you know, uh, God, I think uh, I've got things wrapped up pretty tight down there. I mean, just about everybody is living according to their flesh. Every man right in their own eyes, you know. And they're set on doing evil continually and seem to be enjoying it. Uh, yep, you know, God, things are uh, going pretty good for me and the guys down there. God would answer, oh, I understand fully the heart of humanity, deceitful and desperately wicked, just like you. But not all are following you. There are some exceptions. Verse number eight. And the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? A perfect man and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Hmm. Notice that statement, there is none like him in the earth. That's quite an amazing statement, especially when it's made by the Lord of heaven who knows everything. So God says to Satan, he says, you're down there and you're thinking pretty smug things. And yeah, the human race is wrapped up in all kinds of wickedness. But there are some that are endeavoring to live for me. And he said, have you considered Job? There's nobody else like him on the earth. That's quite an amazing statement. God pointed to this man Job and he made that statement and you know, when I think about it, I begin to wonder what it was about Job that made him so unique and so special in the eyes of God. And I don't know about you, but you say, well, pastor, it'll never be us, but wouldn't it be neat if God would say, you know what, there's none like them on the earth. Hmm. I wonder if there's some elements that I can strive for. Now, I want to read a little bit further. Then Satan, verse 9, answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the works of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now, I got to thinking about this, and what Satan failed to realize is God's perfect knowledge of the human heart. I mean, doesn't God know the end from the beginning? Don't we live by that? I mean, that's how we walk by faith and not by sight. We know that even though we might be facing a trial or a test or something, something bad going on in our lives, we know that God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. We, he knows the future. So when God says, consider my servant Job, there's none like him, and the devil says, well, that's just because you bless him. If, if I get in there and mess with him, or if you reach forth and do something about him, uh, you know, he'll curse you, he'll change. Well, God would already know that. I, I guess what I'm trying to say, if God recommends somebody, wouldn't it be fair to say that we could go forward with that recommendation? I mean, who knows the heart of man better? Now, having said that, it's obvious that the devil was so lifted up in his own pride that he thought he could outmaneuver God. 
And by the way, he still thinks that in spite of all the facts set forth in the Bible. Well, let's get back to Job. What was it about him that would make him stand out so that God would say there is none like him in all the earth? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the testimonies that we've heard tonight. And Lord, now as we consider another testimony, Lord, I pray that it would be um, helpful and, Lord, uh, challenging to even some of those young people that gave testimonies tonight and indeed, Lord, to all of us. And Lord, help us to learn from this life testimony that God gives of Job. In your name we pray, amen. Well, first of all, I would submit to you that Job was a man who loved others. He was a man of love and compassion for others. His children, certainly, and we're going to see in a moment the witness of Eliaphaz, one of his other uh, comforters, will see that he showed much care for people. Now notice, let's go back now, all right, to verse number four. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. So you can imagine that uh, with seven, seven sons, everybody was on for a day. So that was, it was That'd be pretty nice, ladies. You'd only have to cook one day a week, right? You're not getting this, are you? Okay? Seven sons. They invited everybody over. The family came to their house once a week, all right? Some of you are saying that's way too much. I don't even want to do that. All right? So they would call and they would invite everybody to come over. So he had these seven sons and, and they called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them, set them apart, and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of of them all for Job said it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts thus did Job continually so Job was a man that obviously loved his family but he loved them enough to pray and to sacrifice for others Job was a man that was given to prayer for his family and friends, and this was a secret work. But you know, when we come to God in secret, God takes note. In fact, Matthew tells us, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, and pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And he offered burnt offerings at his own expense to be a blessing to them. He said, you know what, I'm concerned about my kids. I don't know all that they're doing, and I want to make certain that they're trying to stay right with God, and so I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to bring these burnt offerings, and I'm going to bring them before God, and I'm going to offer them by their name, and maybe he brought seven or ten of them every day, and he got up early in the morning, made the sacrifice. A guy that wealthy should be able to sleep in, right? But he didn't. He got up and said, I have a business to do with God, and I want to go and intercede on behalf of my family. Job also loved enough to strengthen others. Now, let's go over to chapter 4. We're going to come right back to chapter 1, but let's go over to chapter 4. And this is what Eliaphaz says about Job. Now, it's going to lead into some criticism of Job, but notice what he says in verse 3. Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. Thy words have upholden him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. Now, Job was a man that gave himself to caring for others. If he heard you had a bad time or going through a rough time, guess who showed up at your door? It was Job. He said, you know, hey, I've just come by to see you. I hear things are not going so good. Yeah, it's really rough. Well, you want to talk about it? Can I help you some way? And so Job would take his time and he would visit with people. He would encourage them, strengthen them. And he would say, you know what? God can help you through this. Let's pray about this. And maybe there's something that I can do to help you along. And Job used his wisdom and his words and his wealth to strengthen the weak. That came from a a heart of love. He wasn't so focused on, boy, I'm a rich man. I'm going to stay rich. I got to, you know, keep after my business and do all this. He said, no, I'm going to go and I'm going to take my time to try to encourage those who are in need. And Job loved enough to persevere. At the end of verse 5, going back to chapter 1, notice it says, thus did Job continually. He was always praying, always making sacrifices, always interceding, always doing all that he could.
Job loved and loved and loved. You know, it's really good to find out that somebody has not given up on you. It's good to have somebody who's going to be enough of a friend that they're going to care about you even when you're not doing so well. As one man wrote years ago, a friend is someone who walks in when everybody else walks out. That's what a true friend is. Now tonight, we're familiar with the truth that God looks at our heart, looks at our inner man, and he sees in us, a, does he see a heart that loves and cares for others? Or does he see a heart that's really basically caught up in ourselves? You know, I'm, I'm looking out for me, and we live in a very self-focused, self-centered world. I mean, that is the, the mantra of our day, that, you know, I got to do what's best for me. I got to make certain that my needs are being met. I believe Job's compassionate heart was really one of the keys to his uniqueness upon the earth that God would say, you know what, there's none like him here. Well, let's go on down to verse number eight. And the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect man? Well, I got news for you. Certainly never will that happen in my lifetime. <laughs> I don't know about you, but daily I'm confronted with my many imperfections and knowing the nature of all men, how could this be possible even of Job? So we got to dig a little bit deeper to find out what God meant by this. Now, when you find the word perfect in your Bibles, understand that it doesn't mean without any fault at all. What it does mean is somebody that is complete and somebody that is mature in their faith and character. This Hebrew word means one who is morally and ethically pure. Job was a man that was very purposeful in his relationship with Jehovah God. Now, I do tend to wonder what that relationship was like because you're all sitting here tonight, you got Bibles open, Job didn't have that. The, the law of Moses had not been given, Genesis had not been written yet. Job was a man that, that lived with a relationship that what he knew of God, God took time to reveal to him directly. And so he knew God and walked with him. And all that he knew from God would have been principles instilled in his heart. And as he sought God, God revealed himself to him. There's an interesting passage in the Gospel of John where the Lord talks about that if we love God and if we love him, that they will open themselves up more to us. In other words, the more that you love God, the more God reveals of himself to you. If you feel like you don't know God very well, maybe it is because you don't love him enough. God says, you know, it's just like any kind of human relationship. I mean, there's only certain things that you're going to share with a complete stranger, right? Unless you like to blabber a lot. Some people do. They tell their whole life history on the bus riding down the road. But if not, you're, there are things about your heart, your, your hopes, your sorrows, all those things that you only begin to share with people as you grow what closer to them. And then finally you reach that stage in life, hopefully, that you, there God brings that special someone into your life and then you begin to really open up all those deep things. Well, that's the kind of relationship that Job had with God. And it's a valid principle, this idea is for us today, but we have the added advantage and blessing. We have the Bible, the very words of God. We, have, we are indwelt, if you're saved, you're indwelt by God, the Holy Spirit. You have a church that can encourage you in learning the things of God. You have fellow believers. God presented Job for Satan's consideration, and he said, this is a guy that's perfect. He has a complete godly character. Hmm. So Job was loving, God said he was perfect, but he also went on to say that Job was upright. Now the word upright means straight. That means there's no, no guile. Do you understand what guile is? I think it's a word that we don't always have a handle on. No guile or deceitfulness in Job. He was the same through and through. What you saw is what Job was. So there was no pretending in him, no phoniness about him. I'll tell you, down through the years, there's nothing more disturbing than trying to help people and, and realizing that they're not committed to being real with you. I'll tell you, it's tough when you're always wondering if they're telling the truth. It's tough when you, the, you, you come away saying, thinking to yourself, so did they really mean that or did they just tell me what they thought I wanted to hear? Boy, I've been caught that way several times. 
Now, I'm always willing to give someone the benefit of the doubt, but when I find evidence upon evidence that what they've told me is not what they really are, well, it's very frustrating, very discouraging. Job was the kind of man that if he told you something, you could count on it being so. He was a man of his word. He was a man who was dependable, a man of whom God took notice and said, Job is an upright man. You can count on him. He's a man of character, and there's none like him. Job also feared God. It says in verse 8 also in this description that God is giving one that feareth God. So what does it mean to fear God? Does it mean to live a life in terror that, you know, worry that if I somehow step out of line that God will pick up a heavenly baseball bat and clobber me with it? I don't think that's the kind of fear that God wants from us or that he expects of us or that he even urges us to. So what is fear of God? I believe it is to have a genuine reverence for him and for all that he represents. Now, all of us as kids growing up hopefully had fear for our parents. Right? In other words, when they get home and find out what I've done, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so there was, there was concern there growing up. And the reality is that we need to have a certain reverence for God because God loves us enough that he does say that he will chasten us. Now, Hebrews says that no chastening at the time is pleasant, but he said, for you, it's good. It's going to be helpful for you. And God only ever chastens out of a hand of love. Now, Job was a man that was understood that God was the almighty, holy, and righteous one, the God who dwells in all eternity, the God who created all things, and he recognized that fact, and he lived in devout reverence and respect of the one who rules the universe. You know, the, I think for a lot of us, the problem with our fearing God is that we don't spend enough time thinking about who God is. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago in one of my messages, we talked about Isaiah chapter 6 and how Isaiah, when he was in the very presence of the throne room of God and he saw the Lord high and lifted up and he saw his train of glory fill the temple and he heard the seraphims crying, holy, 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 that Isaiah, this guy that was called as a prophet of God and already had a powerful ministry, suddenly said, woe is me. I'm undone. I, I'm not worthy to be here. I'm a man of unclean lips. And he had been commissioned by God to preach the word. But he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Because mine eyes have seen the Lord. Isaiah saw God for who he was. And it drove him to respect and reverence and say, I don't belong to be here. I wonder tonight. Do you fear God? Do you reverence him? I guess I should maybe phrase it this way. Do you fear God enough that you're concerned that your life would bring honor to him? That your life would be in such a fashion that he would be pleased? I sometimes wonder if we understand what fearing God is all about. It certainly was an aspect of Job's character, and it was something that God said to the devil. He said, have you considered my servant Job? He's a guy that fears me. Obviously, Satan didn't. He's a guy that fears me. And, verse 8, the last, and escheweth evil. Let's all say that together. Ready? Ishueth evil. Now you say, oh, Pastor Connor, there's one of those words. That's the old English in our King James Bible, I'll tell you. Well, let me, let me define it for you, okay, so that you know what Ishueth is. It is a word, Webster's 1828 dictionary means to flee from, to run from, to shun, to avoid. A modern English dictionary defines it as to deliberately avoid and abstain from. 
Now, issue, how many of you used the word issue this week? Anybody? <laughs> Nobody used it. But now we know what it means. It means to avoid. And by the way, it is still in current use. I was reading on Friday. Uh, I, at the end of the day, I'll go through and I've got several uh, news organizations that I read. And I'm reading this article and the guy taught, was talking about some subject and he said, and he eschewed this. And I went, eschew? Uh, Job, uh, book of Job, there it is, right there. And, and so, and of course, did I make note of it? No, I didn't make note of it. And so when I went back, I thought, I'm going to try to find that because I'm going to give that as an illustration that, you know, our Bibles are up to date. That's good English. You can use the word issue. And, and so I did a search on the news website page for issue. And I found, I found a dozen articles in the last year alone that used the word issue in it. So get with it, folks. All right? Understand what it means. It means to flee from it. Now, what did Job issue? Now that we know what it means to avoid, to run, to deliberately turn away from it, what did he issue? The Bible says evil. Meaning all that is contrary to the Lord and our living for him. Job was a man that was concerned with the things that could damage his relationship with God. And so he avoided them. He abstained from those things. He did not see how close he could get to those things. He said, no, I want to turn away from them. I, want to get a, I, I, I don't want to get close to them. First Thessalonians says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, sometimes I think we miss that God is probably less concerned with some arbitrary point of evil that we might reach as he is with the motives that would tell us that we want to get as close to evil as we can. Why is it that we spend so much time justifying our actions to ourselves and others? I think Job would say, why is it that you are so intent on being close to that which is wrong instead of running away from it? God said, here's what makes Job unlike anybody else on earth. He's a man that when it comes to things that are evil and things that he ought not to be involved in, he eschews them, he turns from them, he says, I'm not going anywhere near that. And so Job eschewed evil. But Job also was surrendered. Now, let's, let's get to the part of the story that I know many of you are very familiar with. I'm going to begin in verse 13. I'm going to read several verses now. And there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them and the Sabaeans, an enemy people, fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Wow. All of your wealth, all of your, your staff, the large households in those days, your wealth taken, your livestock, your servants slain, and your children all dead in one fell swoop. So how did Job respond when he lost everything? 
verse 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle. Mantle was a sign of identification, of glory. It wasn't a full garment, so to speak, but it was something that people wore that identified them. It was a sign, really a, a clothing of respect. And he got up and he took it and he tore it into pieces. And he shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. I don't know about you, but when I look at those words, and we are familiar with them, to me, they, every time I read them, they continually amaze me because in the face of total devastation and total loss and heartache, Job somehow was able to focus upon God and the bigger picture, and through his pain and through his sorrow, his faith helped him to surrender to the working of God in his life. He realized that nothing could ever occur in his life. Nothing could ever happen to him without God's permission. And if God allowed it, then it must be for his good. Now, I don't know about you, but it's easy for me to trust God when things are going the way that I want them to go. How many of you find that to be so? You know, when the wind is at my back and the sail and the seas are smooth and everything's going the way I want it to go, I'll tell you what, it's easy to follow God. It's quite another thing to surrender my will to God's will when his will is contrary to my desires. Now, did Job feel loss? Absolutely. We've already seen that he was a man of compassion and love for his children, but through this difficult loss, Job was still able to see God. Can I tell you something tonight that hard times can and will come into your life? But here's here's the scenario. I guess this is what I want you to understand. When we live our lives in a way that we're constantly trying to see how much evil we can get away with, when we are living as close to the world as we can, when, when we are living in a way that you know, is, is not honoring to him when we have little fear of God, when we lack uprightness, when we are not perfect in the faith, the trials are going to hammer us like a sledgehammer. And many a, many a believer has collapsed under the strain. But when we walk with God daily, when we grab hold of the truth of God and God is real in our lives, then we can come to that certainty that God makes no mistakes. And lastly, I leave with you tonight that Job possessed integrity. Now, that wasn't enough for the devil. He was not happy with his outcome. And he went back before God, started up the conversation again, and God said, well, he said, uh, well, I'll tell you what, let's read what he said. And the Lord said in verse 3 of chapter 2, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? There it is. He repeats it. A perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. He holds fast to his integrity. Job's integrity... Basically, integrity, as I understand it, is what I portray on the outside is what I really am on the inside. Okay? And he held fast to it. Even though he maybe had a good reputation, when the trial came, guess what came forth? What was really there? His wife even was upset with him. In verse 9, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. She said, You know what? You've got every reason in the world. We're going through heartache here. You ought to curse God and let's get this over with. And yet Job said, No, no, I'm not going to curse God because I fear him 
I have a relationship that is upright and perfect with him. He would hold on to his integrity. A little bit later on in this book of Job in chapter 27, Yeah, let's go to chapter 27. I'll begin reading verse 1. Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, As God liveth who taketh away my judgment, and the Almighty who hath vexed my soul. I mean, he was feeling the pain. All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. My lips shall not speak wickedly, nor my tongue utter deceit. God forbid that I should justify you. Till I die, I will not remove mine integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast. I will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. Job was a man who lived by an inner conviction that would not be swayed by even the worst of the outward circumstances. He would hold on to his integrity no matter what happened. You know, sadly today, a lot of people turn away from God when things don't go their way. They have the opinion that God should please them and that his purpose should always be to make them happy and when that doesn't happen, well, we'll go find another God to serve. So what would it take to shake your foundation? Can you praise God and trust God whatever the circumstances? You know, I've been reading through this book of Job. I've learned a lot about Job. I've seen a man that pleased God, that earned tremendous commendation from God when God said there's none like him. And I got to thinking, I don't know, do you think the devil ever makes trips into God's throne room today? Do you ever think that God might have a conversation with him and, all right, Satan, where you been? What are you doing? Oh, I've been down on earth. Well, I'll tell you, God, a couple thousand years, we really got this thing wrapped up good. thought it was in Job's day. I wonder, I wonder if God has somebody somewhere, he's, he says, have you considered my servant? There's none like them in all the earth. Are there elements in anybody's life? And I don't know about you, are there elements in in my own life? Do you ever think about that? Would God pick me to be the example? Say, well, what was that kind of man like? Well, the Bible tells us. Would God say that we are a man or a woman or a teenager who loves others? One who is perfect, that is, complete and mature in their faith. One who is upright, authentic, and genuine. One who fears and reverences the Lord. One who runs from evil, not to it. One who is submissive to God's will and sees God's hand in every circumstance. One who has integrity. They're not easily swayed to other things. I don't know, but when I look at Job's character and I look at God's testimony of him, I want to get on my knees and say, God, help me to be like Job. I want to be that one that you can say, hey, there's somebody. Satan, you don't have everybody. You got a lot, but you don't have everybody. Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him. 